Let's pray and ask God for the grace to live that out. This evening we will be looking at verses 24 and 25 of Hebrews. Pray for, for grace and a discipline of heart to consider one another to love and good works. Pray for the blessing of being able to meet together physically uh, again. We know that we're not neglecting that right now. But let's make sure that we long for it with God's purpose in mind. Pray for the grace and the discipline to continue to encourage one, one another because we see the day of Christ drawing near. Let's continue in prayer as we think about what's going on in the world today uh, with the coronavirus. Um, pray for our leaders, mayors, governors, our president, the staff working along with him. Pray that God would give them wisdom as they make decisions uh, concerning the economy and opening it back up. Pray, beloved, that God will bring COVID-19 uh, to an end. But pray, most of all, that we will learn from this trial, that people will be humbled, re repentant, and turn to Christ by faith. There's a purpose in this trial. My friend Elder Walden preached a sermon entitled, We Cannot Go Back to Normal. Let's make sure that we do not go back to normal and that we turn to Christ in repentance, praying that Christ will bring great revival among his people. Pray for the furtherance of the gospel as we have opportunity after opportunity to preach the gospel, to go forth with the gospel of Christ, making disciples. Pray for the sick among us. Uh, pray for, for uh, Brother Jeffrey Menifee, who is now at Siskin, possibly going home on Friday, maybe. Pray for him. Pray for his dear wife and family as they have to make adjustments uh, for him when he does return home. They will need wisdom and the strength of God and the family of God praying and ready to do what is necessary to help this precious, precious family. Remember uh, our beloved uh, sister Brenda Jones and her family, uh, our precious mother, please continue uh, in prayer uh, for them as they continue their journey um, walking with their mother through sickness. Continue to pray for Sister Elysia Worsham and her brother Tyrone as um, they seek to get about their life with, without mom being here on earth. Pray that God would give them good grief, grief that has hope guiding it. Let us go to God uh, in prayer, not just myself, but each one of us, as we have gathered together in unity, not physically together, together, but in the unity of the Spirit, in the bond of peace, we gather together in Christ. Let's pray together, Christian husbands and fathers. Lead your family in prayer together. This is a time for the church to pray. I do know 
It's always a time for the church to pray. It's urgent that we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the privilege of drawing near, a privilege, a blessing that you have granted to every born again believer. We can all draw near to the throne of grace together. And you are so great and so awesome and so mighty. We can all draw near with multiple requests. And you can hear them all at the same time. Oh, Father, we thank you. We thank you that your ear is not more bent to one than to the other. You love all of your adopted children. You love us with an everlasting love. And as we draw near, Father, we know that you hear us. And we know that you're more willing to listen than we are to ask. We come, Heavenly Father, seeking grace and mercy to help in our time of need. We don't have to tell you, Father, but you know we're needy. We cannot get along without you. We come confessing that we have offended your holiness, we have transgressed our iniquities, and perverted and twisted sinfulness we have committed against you. Forgive us, Heavenly Father. Forgive us, dear God, and wash us thoroughly from our iniquities. Cleanse us from all of our sins. As we repent, give us grace to repent. As we seek repentance, Heavenly Father, May we know and experience your true cleansing. You promise to cleanse all who come in repentance and faith. Lord God, we lift up our president, our governors, the president's staff is working with him local mayors, different cities, all who are making decisions in regards to the economy uh, opening back up. I pray, Heavenly Father, for wisdom. I pray that you would give them the wisdom they, that they need in order to make rightful decisions for this country, dear God. I pray, Heavenly Father, I pray that you, by your sovereign hand, you would bring this to your conclusion. Bring this whole difficult trial to your conclusion fitting your purpose for all of the redeemed. I pray that you would save through this trial as more people have hearts now that are softened and ready to listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray that you would use your people to go forth preaching the gospel the only hope and the only deliverance from the bondage of sin, from your wrath to come. It will be a billion times worse than corona. It will be unescapable apart from faith in Christ. I pray that we would learn Christ through this.
Heavenly Father, I pray that we would humble ourselves under your mighty hand. I pray that you would uh, send revival to your people, dear God. I pray, Heavenly Father, that we would long to come back together for your purpose. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would work in us that we may be better fathers, better husbands, better wives, better children, more devoted to you, better uh, disciples of Christ walking with you, Heavenly Father. I pray that we would long to come back with the purpose of considering one another according to your word, stirring up one, one another to love and good works, not ever having the desire to neglect the assembling of the saints, but to encourage one another as we see the day approaching. Pray for that grace, Heavenly Father. I pray, dear God, for Brother Jeffrey Menifee. I pray, Heavenly Father, for mercy upon his body. I pray that you would cause him to gain more strength, Heavenly Father, to be able to walk like he uh, 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 once walked, to be able to do that again. Put strength into him, Father God. Touch his body, and I pray, dear God, for Sister Anita and her family. I pray that you would give them strength and you would give them endurance as they prepare for the day that he arrives home, that you would enable them to make the necessary adjustments for his good, Heavenly Father, and give them the strength to be able to serve him as they walk together through his sickness. I pray for Sister Brenda Jones and her family as they have been walking together for quite a while now. I thank you for your perseverance that I can see that you put into her, that you've given her grace to endure so much already, Heavenly Father. I pray that you would continue to give her and her family, all of her siblings, grace in this time of need. And I pray, Heavenly Father, most of all, that you would give her dear mother grace and mercy in this time of need. Lord God, remember Sister Elysia, her brother, I pray, Heavenly Father, that they would know the sweetness of your presence in a way perhaps that they have never known before, that they would know your comfort, that they would know your peace, that they would know you are with them. Your presence means everything. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would give your servant grace to teach this evening. Feel me, Holy Spirit. Enable me to say what you intended to say. Lock my mind and my heart in your word. Give me understanding, Lord. Cause your word to, to come gushing out of my soul the truth of your word. I pray for your people. Unite our hearts in your word. Open every heart that is listening. And Holy Spirit, apply it to every heart that is listening. Work in us sanctifying us through the truth. Heavenly Father, any other prayer requests that I fail to mention, 
hear the cries of that person's heart right now as they cry out to you. I ask in Jesus' holy name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Okay. So we have been studying Hebrews chapter 10. Verses 19 through 25, let's begin by reading God's holy word. Hopefully you have your Bibles open to that passage, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. It reads, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We have been speaking from this, teaching from this theme, the community for stimulating faith. I start with what I started with last week. The church's fellowship is profound, spiritual, and real. It is a shared common life that is absolutely essential. It is what our Lord prayed for in his famous prayer in John 17, his high priestly prayer, where he repeatedly said, I pray that they may be one. Jesus was not praying from, for some kind of a social oneness, but for a spiritual reality. That prayer was answered when the church was born. Jesus prayed that the Father would make his children one just as he and the Father are one. That's, that is an amazing parallel. We are one in the way that the Son, the Father, and the Spirit are one. Trinitarian fellowship is the model for fellowship in the church. A shared life, shared love, shared purpose, shared truth, and shared power. Beloved, the church is made up of natural enemies. What binds us is not common education, common race, common income levels, common politics, common nationality, common accents, common jobs, or anything else of that sort. Christians come together because we have all been saved by Jesus Christ. We are a band of natural enemies who love one another for Jesus' sake. Believers, as we know, have different careers, different political views, different economic status, and different cultural backgrounds. We are different in many ways. 
Yet we are still drawn together in the body he calls the church. See, you see, unity in the gospel is much deeper than surface uniformity. This is a powerful community created by God, created by the Spirit of God, a community that the Lord has brought together. A community consisting of blood-bought believers. We have looked at thus far the basis for community. We saw that Christ must be preeminent. We saw the privilege of entry into God's presence, verse 19. We saw the possession of a great high priest, verse 21. Then, next, we began looking at the building blocks of community. The building blocks, and there are three essential building blocks in a community of biblical faith. When we gather together as an assembly of disciples of Christ, these building blocks must be present in order for God to be pleased with our worship and fellowship. We've already looked at the first two building blocks. Number one, drawing near in worship. Drawing near in worship. We looked at how we are to draw near with a true heart, a heart that is true, genuinely devoted to God, confident faith, and remember, the first two, a true heart and confident faith, are conditions we must meet. The last two are conditions that Christ has already met. A clean conscience. Our conscience is clean because Christ has dealt with our guilt at Calvary. A clean body speaks of the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. So, beloved, the evidence of salvation in this context is that we draw near because the, the work of Christ has been applied to our hearts by the Spirit. So number one, what's the first building block? Drawing near with a true heart, a competent faith, a clean conscience, and a clean body, washed, given a new heart by the Spirit. That's the first building block, drawing near in worship. The second building block holding fast in hope. May I remind you, this is the building blocks for community, not for certain officers in the church, not for leadership, but for the community of believers, holding fast in hope. And we saw that in verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Now, beloved, as we continue our study this evening, I want to look at a third building block. The third building block is found in verses 24 and 25 of Hebrews chapter 10. Let me read the verses again. Verse 24 and 25. 
And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The third building block is this, encouraging growth in godliness. Encouraging growth in godliness. Verses 24 and 25, we will look together at this third building block this evening. So this third building block of community is the mutual encouragement of believers towards Christ's likeness that helps prevent our own apostasy or turning from the faith. All of us left to ourselves or like Demas, Demas fell in love with this present world and deserted the work of Christ. However, as we continually apply these Christ-centered truths and keep the implications of the cross evident in our relationships within the body, we feed one another's growth and perform preventive maintenance on our own soul. Let's dive into these verses, and let's see how we're called to encourage growth in godliness. We do not come together without purpose. And our coming together again, when we, when we finally come back together, resurrected and all who are listening, let's make sure we keep God's purpose found in these verses in mind. How do we encourage one another? Well, the writer here of Hebrews continues, and he says in verse 24, let us consider. Stop right there. Let us consider. That's an important word. The word consider means to place the mind down upon. To place the mind down down upon, to place the mind down upon, to consider thoughtfully. The writer is insisting that uh, believers take careful note of one another's spiritual welfare. We are our brother's keeper. We're not Cain. We are our brother's keeper. We are to keep an eye on one another, to hold one another accountable for our spiritual walks because our common hope in Christ results in a binding relationship for mutual growth. Here, beloved, is a summons to a life of loving community. William Lane, William Lane describes it as a continued care for one another that finds an expression in love, good works, and the mutual encouragement that active participation in the gatherings of the community makes possible. This is not an invitation for us to be judgmental busybodies, making the lives of others a burden. That's not what he's saying. 
But it does mandate that we take a, 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 a interest in the affairs of other believers. We are to study and implement schemes that motivate one another in godly living. Place the mind upon, consider thoughtfully, or do, do not just gather together because it's Sunday. No, he says when we come together, we need to consider thoughtfully Place our mind down upon the welfare, the spiritual welfare of our brothers and sisters. This is important. The purpose of this practice of biblical fellowship is, the writer says, to stir up one another. That's interesting. Stir up comes from a word meaning irritating, inciting, stimulation. The same word is translated disagreement in Acts 15, 39 with reference to the dispute between Paul and Barnabas. Solomon said in Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Believers are to irritate, if you will, each other toward growth. And beloved, follow me. This refers to a healthy tension, a healthy tension that promotes growth because biblical change normally takes place alongside of the people. However, too many believers avoid difficult situations or people that challenge their thinking when in reality, God intends to use others to move us toward spiritual maturity. Listen to um, Timothy Lang and Paul Tripp. This is in a book entitled, from a book, excuse me, entitled, How People Change. Here's what Paul Tripp says. At one level, we want friendships. At another level, we don't want them. In creation, we were made to live in community. But because of the fall, we tend to run from the very friendships we need. Quite often, our longing for them is tainted by sin. We pursue them only as long as they satisfy our desires and needs. We have a love-hate relationship with relationships. Christ. Our fellowship is an essential ingredient, ingredient for lasting change. The work of redemption involves our individual relationship with Christ alongside our relationship with others. Many helpers, many helpers fail to move struggling people into the rich context of redemptive relationships. Instead, they cling to the arid individualism of our society. They have a Jesus in me mindset as they battle sin and seek to become more like Christ. End quote. I think Tripp is on to something. 
in contrast to the pride of individualism, you notice here, God wants his people to be faithful in meeting together for the purpose of inciting one another to love and good works. Wow. Stir up one another to love and good works. Place your mind down upon the spiritual welfare of, 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 of your brothers and sisters in order to stir them up to love and good works. Follow me. I'm going to give you this definition of love. If God gave me. Love here is to sacrificially seek God's highest good and I put in parentheses according to his word God's highest good for another person. Love is to sacrificially seek God's highest good for another person. That's what we see at Calvary. Good works are works that God, that has God as its source, others as its target, and the glory of God as its goal. We ought to stimulate other believers to love and good works. I want you to hold your finger at Hebrews and turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 2. I want to show you something here. It's real important. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul is speaking of being saved by grace through faith. And that's not of ourselves. It's a gift from the Lord. Everything hinges on verse 4, the very first words, but God. And when we get to verse 10, after saying that our salvation is not a result of works so that no one may boast, we're saved only by grace. But when he gets to verse 10, he says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for, that's purpose, for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You see, the source of our good works in that verse is God. And the goal is for his glory. Now, when you look at Hebrews, when it shows us the target, we're to stir up one another, stir up one another stimulate one another to love and good works. So, it's actually through obeying verse 24, stirring up one, one another to love and good works, it's actually through stirring up one another that we help and encourage one another to fulfill what I just read in Ephesians 2, verse 10. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We help one another fulfill, carrying out the good works that we are prepared for. 
good works, what are they? Well, we know that in every situation we, we are to obey God's law, worshiping him only, reverencing God's name only, honoring those in authority, not doing violence, but promoting others' well-being, guarding against lust, respecting others' property, speaking the truth in love, cultivating godliness with contentment. We know that. We also know that God has given each Christian, each of us, particular gifts, abilities, and opportunities. We are to be faithful stewards of them, serving God's kingdom, promoting God's glory, and imparting practical blessings. Some of us have the gift of teaching, so we are to teach. Others are empowered for exhortation and encouragement. Others are gifted in helps or serving or in administration or in comfort. Each of us is given a role to play and a way, uh, to, and a way to serve, and it's important that we do our part as God predestined for us to do. There are good works that all Christians are to embrace as a willing duty. We are different in many ways, but we're all called to pray, to spread the gospel, to worship with God's people, to support God's work through generous giving. That's God's plan for us, and God has made full provision for our blessing through obedience. Stir up one another to the good works I just mentioned. We meet together to stir up one another. We have a tendency to avoid people who actually want to do this. Listen, the times we are tempted to avoid others are the very times we need to, to be the most steadfast fastly committed in the church. We can't live the Christian life alone. We're saved individually from our sins, yet we are not saved in a vacuum. We're saved into a mutually edifying community of believers who are building up each other and spurring each other on to love and good works. The church is a body consisting of many parts, none of which can thrive on its own. We need one another. Answer this question in your own heart. We can't go back to normal. Previously in our gathering together, has this been your purpose? That's tight, but it's right. I know that's painful. It's challenging. It's convicting. It should lead us to repentance. Think again with me. The word stir up means to incite or provoke or stimulate. Stir up one another to love and good works. The way we live and talk and act should be provocative to other Christians, in the best sense of the word, of course. They should be reminded of spiritual truth because of what we are saying and how we are living. The result of our example and conversation should be love and good works in the lives of other believers. Let me ask you, then, if the way you handle yourself provokes others to take seriously what the Bible teaches. 
Does your counsel cut against the grain of worldly logic and press home the claims and promises of God? Does your behavior set a helpful model for weak and new believers? Listen, saints. If not, you're not making the impact you should for Christ's work in the church. And you're coming and attending and gathering without purpose. Stir up one another. One another. That's the positive side, but there's a negative side. Don't miss this. There's a negative side uh, to this building up. In verse 24, go back there. It's, excuse me, in verse 25, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. Wow. Believers are not to neglect regular fellowship. Meeting together. This is important. It's important not for just when we come back together. It's important now. Do not neglect meeting together. You should be so hungry for the preaching of the gospel of, of, of Jesus Christ, for the teaching of God's word, that every time we say we're going to be on live stream, gather your family together and hear the word of God. Notice I said, gather your family together. I'm not talking about parents coming, but children in the other room doing whatever. No, I'm talking about gathering together. This word neglecting is a present active participle coming from a verb meaning to leave behind. The assembling that believers are not to be careless about refers to the regular gathering together of Christian believers for worship and exhortation in a particular place. You want to stir up one another. You want to consider one another. You want to have your mind thinking thoughtfully about the spiritual welfare of one another, but you can't do that if you neglect meeting together. Obviously, we see here that it is a sin against the Word of God to neglect meeting together. I can't tell you how many times I've been asked, well, do you have to attend church? And my answer is always, yes, it's a command from God. He wants us to meet together. This can't be our new normal. Our hearts should be longing, crying out to God, because we want Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. It's obvious, obviously, it's obvious some were relaxing their involvement at the public meetings of the local church to the point that it was becoming a habit. What habits are you forming during COVID-19? Maybe these people were once faithful and had gradually departed but now they're experiencing spiritual decline because of lack of exposure to the word of God and the stimulation of other believers. The writer of Proverbs said, 
Proverbs 27, 8, like a bird that wanders from her nest, so is a man who wanders from his home. Listen, some in this context were short-circuiting their own sanctification because of a lax view of the priority of biblical fellowship coming together. They were short-circuiting their own sanctification. It is for this reason, it is because of this passage and others as well, all through Acts, Paul's letters, it is for this reason that I stand firmly and teach that to be obedient to God, every believer in Christ should be a member of a Bible-teaching local church. Every disciple needs spiritual leaders to equip him or her for ministry. And every disciple needs others in the family of God to serve and to be accountable to. We all have sharp edges that need to be smoothed by continual contact with others. <laughs> Listen, I'm going to say this. To a great extent, our spiritual growth directly hinges upon it. It's unfortunate, but I see a growing movement of people who are completely abandoning the concept of a local assembly. These independent Christians are trying to live the Christian life in isolation. In many cases, this neglect is the fruit of pride and self-will on the part of those who cannot bring themselves to serve others. They refuse to submit to one another. They refuse to submit to spiritual leadership, which is a common result of refusing to submit to the Lordship of Christ. They may experience an increase in knowledge, but they will not grow in love. And here's why. Love only grows in the context of relationships. Love only grows in the context of relationships. Brother Don Whitney said this, to which I fully agree. No one develops the proper spiritual balance just by listening to Christian radio, watching Christian television, or reading Christian books. He said, Pastor's gone crazy. Well, keep listening. He goes on to say, you can't get this kind of maturity merely by participating in a group Bible study. Unless you're an active part of a local church, your Christian life and ministry will be imbalanced, end quote. According to Scripture, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. According to Scripture, biblical love is directed toward other people. If there are no other people, growth becomes imbalanced. This won't make you shout, but it will make you live right and come back with purpose. <laughs> so, in contrast to those who have made a custom of forsaking the local assembly, go back to Hebrews, what do we need to do? 
verse 25, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Encouraging one another. That requires uh, us to come alongside other people with words and actions that will strengthen them in Christ. Encouragement may mean uh, bearing a load for them. It may mean prayer, companionship, or sharing our own conviction that, that God is faithful based on how he has dealt with us according to his word. It may mean all of that and more. The writer of Hebrews made this same point in chapter 3. You can turn there in chapter 3, verse 13. Chapter 3, verse 13. Listen to the word of God. We'll start at verse 12. Take care. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. Listen to verse 13. But exhort one another every day as long as it is called today and that, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Wow. Love grows in the context of relationships, fellowships, where there's people who are considering, thinking about other spiritual welfare, welfare, thinking about how to stir them up to love and good works. We ought to be like, like clamors going up a steep mountain. One can't fall without the other because everyone is roped together. We ought to be like soldiers teamed together on a battlefield, all shooting and aiming at the same target. We got to keep track of one another. Back to Hebrews 10. As we finish this up. Not neglecting to meet together is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more, as you see the day drawing near. I believe the day here refers to the return of Christ. And when Christ returns, there's going to be an enormous innumerable company of believers gathering. If you have hope in that gathering, you ought to be committed to this gathering. In fact, it is motivation to be committed to this gathering. It, is, it, it motivates one's heart not to neglect this gathering, to stir up people to love and good works in this gathering, to encourage one another in this gathering because we are longing and see the day approaching of that gathering. What an incentive. <laughs> Just think of, of challenging a brother or sister in the truth, and they ask you, well, why are you challenging me? Why, you, why are you challenging me like this with the word of God? And they say to you, because I believe Jesus is coming. One of the sad things in our world of tolerance 
and relativism is this. We've gotten so far away from a local church like this. When I mention um, you're not going to grow in love just by listening to Christian radio or reading Christian books, etc. That probably, that, that may have challenged some of you, but I still stand on it. Because love does grow in the context of relationships. A man can't grow in love for his wife by living in Germany, reading Christian books about love while she lives in Chattanooga. He may increase in knowledge, but he can't grow in love because love, love is the sacrificial giving of yourself for God's highest good for another person. Some of us have become so relativistic where we say, well, that works for me, Pastor. I, I hear what you're saying, but that works for me. And I say to you, in love, that's relativism, that's worldly, because that's the same thing the Hindu says. My religion works for me. That's the same thing people are saying all uh, 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 over the world. Well, it's right for me. It's okay for me. We're not talking about what's okay for you. We're, we're, we're declaring what God has said to be the truth. What's okay for you is irrelevant. What God has declared is relevant. Let us. You've got let us in verses 22 and t through 24. Let us, let us, let us. These are responsibilities that believers must fulfill together, not alone. That's why he says, let us together. All three uses the present tense, which means that the writer was encouraging his readers to keep on doing these things. But you say, Pastor, but I have not been doing them. Repent and start. That's the beauty of the gospel. New starts, new starts, new starts. Keep doing it until Christ's return and or until we meet him in death. There will never be a time when we do not need to be actively involved in the community of faith that stimulates us towards holiness. We cannot do it alone. The believer is not alone in his confession of Christ, nor is he to act in isolation. He is linked with others both by nature and grace, and he's called upon to seek to stir up his brethren unto love and to good works, assembling with fellow saints for worship, prayer, and testimony, not cold-heartedly withdrawing himself as the manner of some, but remembering his responsibility toward his brethren. What a privilege we have, but it comes with responsibility. It comes with responsibility. Our privilege should compel us to be faithful to a local assembly of believers in Jesus Christ. It should compel us to live in community. These are the building blocks for community, standing on the basis that we have laid out for you. This is, uh, is the purpose for which we gather. Verse 
And that purpose should be evident even now when we're not able to gather. When you tune in live stream, don't tune in while you're cooking or doing something else. You can't be listening to God and while you are intentionally distracted by trying to do something else and then listen, oh, what'd he say? No, no, no. Tune in. God is speaking. Drop everything. God is speaking. Your family should be there. I invite you to read Titus chapter 2, I think it's verses 1 through 8, gives you an even broader understanding of what community needs to look like. Older men should be discipling and encouraging younger men. Older women should be discipling and encouraging younger women. And even young men should be sensible. We've lost so much because we have ventured so far away from the Word of God. This is the community of faith. Close. With this, the church is a body. The church is a family. The church is an assembly of the redeemed, linked, united together in Christ. The not independent, but interdependent. God has equipped and is equipping the church for discipleship. I know we have a lot of weaknesses. The church does. But there's nothing on earth greater. Because there's nothing on earth that Jesus said he would build. And when it came to his death, according to Ephesians 5.25, that's who he died for. Jesus is the glory of the church. He loves her. He died for her with all of her spots and wrinkles. He's at work in and through the church. So, we see the basis for community. We see the building blocks for community. I have received, I think, a couple of texts here. One question is, uh, God says, assemble. But with this virus, I don't feel safe sitting among others at this time. Will I be shamed by others? We are where we are because of the sovereignty of God. Uh, right now, I know very few that are assembling together. Uh, we will not be here on this coming Sunday. Hopefully, we'll be back soon. But I realize that people with underlining conditions may not be able to come back as soon as others. Elderly people may not be able to uh, come back as um, quick as others, obviously. And with Resurrected, as the leadership here, our desire 
is to lead you in the worship of Christ. But we also desire your safety uh, as well. So the answer to that question is, no, you will not be uh, shamed by others. But I encourage you to continue to look to God and to trust God and to ask God, to beg God, to enable you to assemble back together with the saints. And I can't help but believe that God would answer that request because it's for his glory. Other questions? You're welcome to uh, share with me, text me other questions you may have at this time. Please zoom in. Other questions, if there are disagreement, we can still reason together. <laughs> Even though we're not present together, we can reason together from the Word of God. You know what I say quite often, God is right, everybody else is wrong. And when I say God is right, I'm referring to His Word, not what I say. If what I say is inconsistent with His Word, then I'm wrong. His Word is always right. Okay, another question. Our church community <clears throat> has changed during this virus. How can we show the world we are still united when we are all, when we all are separated in different homes? That's a good question. Thank you for that question. Well, uh, first of all, uh, our unite uniting is in Christ, okay? Our first, our unity, first of all, is in Christ. According to Ephesians, it is the unity of the Spirit. So first, our unity is in Christ, and because we are in, separated in our homes right now, it does not mean we have unity, excuse me, it does not mean we, we are not in unity. For example, uh, resurrected is continuing to carry forth the mission of the church, which is to preach the gospel of Christ. We're doing it by way of live stream, and I trust and hope that members of Resurrected are continuing to go forth with the gospel of Christ in communities or in workplaces, wherever God may have you, uh, preaching the gospel to make disciples. So we still live in unity as long as we still live by faith. We still carry out, maintain, let me put it that way, the unity of the Spirit as long as we still seek to live by faith in obedience to the Lordship of Christ, to the authority of His Word. We do long to be back together, but I would say this as well, ways we can show the world, look for opportunities, providential opportunities that God gives to serve others. Go forth with the, with the gospel of Christ. Be willing, by God's grace, to help when it is safe, of course, for you to, uh, to do so. So, although we are separated, we're still committed to the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace because our unity is spiritual. First of all, it's in Christ. And we gather together to maintain that unity. And I firmly believe that God will bring us back together in his own time. I firmly believe that God will bring us back together in his own time. It might not look like, and it will not look like it has before. You know, for example, resurrected here, we're going to 
take chairs out and uh, space so that when you come back together, you will automatically be spaced and distanced from, from, from others in terms of your seating. More will be given through Cash App. Um, offering will be as you come in. Um, it's going to look differently, okay? But at the same time, um, although it looks differently, we can still be committed to the same purpose, the purpose that I have been teaching over the past few weeks for the ultimate glory of God, to give him praise. Thank you for that question. It's another question. It's the day approaching talking about uh, rapture or Sunday worship. Um, the day approaching in Hebrews, I believe we're talk, talking, speaking of the return of Christ. It's not, uh, it's not talking about Sunday worship. It's speaking of the return of Christ. Now, some have uh, argued that the day approaching is speaking of um, the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70 because of the uh, timing of the writing of the book of Hebrews. But I would argue that the day approaching is the return of Christ, our Lord. And On mute. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Donnie. Brother Donnie said, check your mic. <laughs> In closing, I, I know it's a difficult time and it's a very fearful time. But I do remind you that God is in control. I remind you of his sovereignty. I remind you of the greatness of his power. I remind you that he's for, not against the church. And if the Lord be for us, who can be against us? And I do remind you that God causes all things to work together together 
for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And that purpose is to conform us to the very image of Jesus Christ through whatever he, the Lord brings in his sovereignty. The Lord will bring us back together because his word declares we are to be together. So he will bring us back together. There were times in the Old Testament when Israel was scattered. This may hurt a little bit, but because of her sin, because of her sin, and God had to humble her and bring her to repentance, then bring her back into the land. So please, check your heart. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. I got... I got... Malachi, this is from Malachi Long. <laughs> Malachi wants to know if we, if we will still have Bible study in Sunday school at church or live stream. <laughs> Bless his heart. I'm glad, I'm glad he wants to know that. We, we will start out just having our worship service, and it will uh, continue to start at 1030 on Sunday morning. That's what we'll start out with and we'll just watch the hand of God and see how the Lord works before we uh, open up Sunday school again. So um, to answer your question, Malachi, we, we will not have Sunday school by way of live stream. <laughs> okay, do over the last five minutes, Mike was muted. I don't remember what I was answering. <laughs> okay, um, I think I was answering Sister um, Marcia's question, um, I believe, Sister Newby. Will there still be live stream when the church reassembles? I believe I was answering that question, I think. And my answer was there will still be live stream when we reassemble because we want to continue to uh, reach out uh, to members who will not be able to come back immediately. Um, and we want to continue to reach out to people who may be confined to their homes and cannot assemble, that have started to listen uh, uh, to us and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, we do respect uh, people with underlining conditions, elderly people. We understand. So we, we, our desire is to continue to uh, preach the gospel to you, whether you're able to come or, or not. And so I, I think that's what I was uh, saying when I was on, on mute. <laughs> and that's my fault, by the way, sorry. Uh, I do want to um, answer, um, yeah, Sister Erdis had a question pertaining to the text. Um, is this the same usage 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 6, as Hebrews 10, 25. So Paul speaking to Timothy regarding stirring up the gift. Oh, that's some good thinking there. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in his suffering for the gospel by, oh wait, wait a minute, that's the wrong, wrong verse. Verse 6, 2 Timothy 1, 6, for this reason I remind you to, to fan into flame, yes, the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of um, my hands. Yes, I, 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 I see your question now in 2 Timothy 1, 6, Hebrews uh, 10, 25, 
and um, Paul telling Timothy in 2 Timothy uh, himself, Paul telling him himself to fan into flame the gift of God. But the idea of stirring up, I, I see, do see very clearly uh, in both passages. Uh, in verse 6 of 2 Timothy, Paul saying, fan into flame or stir up. He's saying, Timothy, you fan into flame. I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you. And so there's a sense in which Paul is stirring him up, and, and, and that's very good, Sister Ertis. That's a sense in which Paul is stirring him up to love and good works, okay, by reminding him, okay? And that reminder is a, it's a challenge as well. And then he says, you fan the flame. So, yes, I, that, that's a good connection, uh, wonderful connection you made there uh, with those passages. Any other questions? My dear, one of my dear sisters said, uh, you don't have anywhere to go, so if you have questions, go ahead. <laughs> we have a few more minutes. Okay, another question regarding Bible study and how it will look um, uh, as we start back. Uh, we, will, we will more than likely continue in the beginning, at least, we will continue to live stream uh, Bible study on Wednesdays, even once we uh, come back, uh, at least initially, we will continue to do that. Uh, for this reason, you know, we, we want to pay attention to, close attention to what's going on and what's happening uh, with this uh, COVID-19. Um, our, our concern is that we put no one at risk. We, we do not create any type of environment for people to be able to... Uh, contract the virus, so, you know, for example, even on Sunday, when we do come back, if you're sick, please stay at home, um, feel free to wear uh, a mask. I would actually recommend it, at least walking in and walking out. Um, um, I'm not saying you have to sit here the whole time, but, you know, we'll have sanitizer uh, at the door. The doors will be... Uh, um, up to open, even the outside door, um, for you to come in uh, as well. So we're thinking through this, but initially we will continue to live stream um, our Bible studies and keeping an eye on what's going on uh, in our world. Okay, another good question. To study ahead for next Wednesday, what verses to study? Um, on next Wednesday, uh, Elder Eves, um, the um, fellow laborer here in the gospel, will be uh, teaching the Word of God on next Wednesday. Uh, and he will be teaching out of the book of Jude um, and so I, you'll be safe if you study uh, Jude chapter 1, uh, uh, look and study in greater detail verses 15 to, to the end of the chapter. I think you'll be uh, safe in, ter in terms of preparing for next week. And um, Elder Eves is speaking of um, giving a defense, defending the gospel of Jesus Christ in these trying and difficult days that we live in, live in is apologetics, uh, standing for truth and contending for um, the faith. But thank you for um, your, your willingness to, to, to study ahead. But that's what we'll be next week. 
And if I have um, said wrongly, Elder Eves, please text me now. <laughs> but he will be teaching next week um, our study. And we'll, we'll work together and see how it's going to look from um, ma mapping, it, mapping everything out through the summer. Anyone else? I close by saying I love you, church. I love the privilege of shepherding here at, at Resurrected and also others who uh, I get a chance to preach the gospel to and teach the word of God to that I may have never met. Um, and you've just met me through live stream. Uh, thank you for joining us and being a part of um, of, of, of this work that God is doing here. And Elder Eves did just text me. The particular verse is Jude, verse 20. Verse 20, okay? That he will, um, by God's grace, unpack for us next week. Verse 20 of Jude. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. I did get a text. Let's see, where is it? From Sister, uh, Sister Joanne Jax um, concerning uh, Brother Robert Chester. Um, understand uh, he's been in Memorial Hospital all week and is in intensive care. So let's, let's close in prayer for the application of God's word, and for our brother as well. Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for your word. It's challenging, Heavenly Father, and when I hear your word, I run to the throne of grace because, Lord, everything that you command us to do is humanly impossible. We can only do it in the strength and power of the Spirit. That's why you command us to be filled with the Spirit. That's why Jesus said, without him, we can do nothing. So, Father, as we discipline ourselves unto godliness, as we eagerly and willingly, joyfully seek to obey you, may we know his power in his presence. If there's anyone listening that is not saved, I pray that you would bring that person or persons to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Send the Holy Spirit. Cause that person to be born again. And I pray, Heavenly Father, for Brother Chester. I don't know what's going on with this body, but I know I don't even have to tell you because you already know. <laughs> I pray for mercy and grace to help him in this time of need. I pray for strength. I pray for healing. I pray for growth in godliness. Bless his wife and his daughter and all of his family. In Jesus' holy name, amen.